Дорогие друзья, добрый день. Uh, dear friends, good day to you. My name is Konstantin Ivanov, and uh, we'll take a few more minutes before we start because this session is of great interest and of great importance for all of us, not only for the doctors but for general public. So let us wait for two more minutes, and we are going to start very shortly. Дорогие друзья, перед тем, как мы начнем... So, dear friends, before we start, I have a request for you. We certainly are not at Bolshoi Theater, but no, in order not to disturb our speakers, I would like to ask you to put your mobile phones to silent mode. All right. Uh, so we kindly ask you to take your seats. And before we start, I would like to say that it is a pleasure to see so many familiar faces, so many professors. It is really very heartening. And it is great to understand that there is a quorum. For me, it is an obvious thing. So, dear friends, with your permission, I would like to start. Allow me to introduce myself. My name is Konstantin Ivanov. I am cardiologist, and I'm also a TV journalist. And I would like to tell you that a few minutes ago, on the fringes of the conference, we discussed a number of questions with the speakers, and we apologize uh, for the fact that we turn our backs to some of you. It is a roundtable discussion, uh, and we apologize for that, uh, and uh, we will work under given conditions. First of all, I will tell you that the assembly called Healthy Moscow is very interesting this year because there are a lot of events within the forum, starting from the doctor, uh, the speech of Steve Jobs, a doctor, and he talked about 18 rules of life, and by the way, we interviewed him, and you can have a great discussion about that, but there was an epic fail with a Japanese scientist who is a Nobel Prize winner, because what happens here and uh, why it is so important to bring so many colleagues ago, a long time ago, there was a scandal about interval starving, whether it's good or not. And uh, same what happened to ketogen uh, diet. So people were waiting for a Nobel Prize winner who specializes on this uh, issue. However, he does not, and uh, therefore it means it was a false myth. So patients understood that we can be trusted because we started talking about this issue. Getting back to our issue, we are going to talk about the future of diagnostic radiology, and we have a number of topics to discuss, but I do not want this discussion to be formal because actually we are going to talk about the future of the medicine. We can talk about cardiology, gynecology, neurology, etc etc but without you the uh, we cannot do anything because you help us to diagnose issues so let us talk about the development of technologies because they're developing at a great pace and on one hand it is very good on the other hand we understand there's a big gap between doctors and specialists that diagnose uh, diagnose um, 
uh, the diseases and some doctors do not understand how the technologies work and therefore team approach here is of great importance and Sergey Morozov talks about it. Now I would like to introduce my speaker, our speaker Sergey Morozov, Chief Freelance Specialist in Radiation and Instrumental Diagnostics, Moscow Department of Health. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, yes, it's good that you give applause. And also we have a great uh, guest, uh, Paul Perizeld, uh, who is the head of radiology department at Antwerp Clinic. And I would like to add that Paul Perizal has around 20 different credentials. He's one of the most famous radiologists worldwide. He's the president of European Society, and he's an honorable member of many associations. And now Paul helps to improve healthcare situation in Australia. That's right. I found out about it two minutes ago. Now I would like also to give the round of applause to Professor Sinead and a legend in Russian healthcare. And now I understand that we can start. Well, dear friends, I think we will do the following. Now we are going to give the floor to Sergey and Paul. We will listen to their presentations and then we will have a proper med talk and we will be able to voice all the issues we have whatsoever. So Sergey, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. It's always a pleasure to see Constantin at different events because we need to have out of the box uh, view on certain matters and uh, actually when it comes to x-ray uh, ultrasound uh, diagnostics or diagnostic radiology basically these are uh, certain specialties but um, we may call this different in different ways and we can combine them so here in russia we have one system in europe it can be something else but it is very important not to put the doctor and the diagnostic specialist on different sides. They should work hand in hand and they should work as a team and as a team they should develop together. But now this session allows us to give you presentations in the freestyle and we can talk about uh, the trends in um, uh, broadly and also let us uh, fantasize and see what is going on worldwide. In 1916, there was, uh, there was a certain dependence. The countries that would uh, that earned more would have longer life expectancy. But now, see what is going on in two. Uh, in 2018, the trend has reversed, and we can see that all countries uh, have longer life expectancy. This is good news. It means that life expectancy is increasing worldwide, and uh, people can enjoy universal health coverage. People get food, water, medicines, antibiotics, etc., etc. So we can say that healthcare is developing and the quality of life uh, develops as well. However, we can see that focus is shifting and points of providing uh, medical aid are changing as well. We expect that in the near future, medical aid will be available anywhere not necessarily in a hospital or outpatient clinic, and we can do it by using gadgets, uh, telemedicine, etc. And uh, think of the applications that are offered by banks, same will happen with medical services. So far, we may not understand it, we may feel cautious about it, but think of the tools of medical diagnostics. We can do ultrasound, um, can offer ultrasound to patients, uh, application of the patient, not necessarily application of the doctor. And uh, it is already possible so we can get closer to the patient. It uh, may uh, be a big change and so far we still experience misunderstanding. We understand that ultrasound machines should become more portable, mobile, so we get closer to the patient. and. Um, we understand that the environment for holding ultrasound diagnostics should be different uh, and uh, this is something what is discussed at plenary sessions. We understand that mobile diagnostics, telemedicine, digitalization uh, makes 
our work more convenient, but it also requires the changes in organizing the process, and it, we should get away from our stereotypes. 21% of medical aid should be provided at home of the patient, and uh, the patient can meet the doctor at any convenient location. And I will give you one of the examples that is providing doctor's advice and receiving medicines in Asia, and it already happens in China. That is when the patient can get doctor's advice in this small booth, and he gets prescription, and he immediately gets the medicine. So... Think of the booths, uh, think of uh, those booths that were organized uh, across Moscow in summer, and there was a lot of debate about it, about the scope of services that were available. But even if it is expensive, still we are moving closer to the patient, and that is important. Of course, every initiative has to be analyzed and has to be improved. I will give you another example. I will not be surprised that instead of uh, booths that uh, I used to make photographs, uh, will same booths will be used to offer fluorography. And uh, you talk about uh, traditional safety, but think of the radiation burden if you do the x-ray of lungs. It's minimal. So think of the regulations. On one hand, there are many barriers, and they do not allow to bring x-ray machines um, out of hospitals. And uh, in Russia, maybe not all of you know, in order to offer a CAT machine to a hospital, you need to uh, have uh, two sets of associated equipment and our sanitary requirements are very rigid and you cannot uh, uh, organize it in a compact way. So we need to change the process around the patient. We are talking about uh, a new model when instead of moving the patient along the chain from the reception, from lines, consulting, lab tests, uh, uh, receiving medicine, etc., etc., we can move it around. And you know that when it comes to breast cancer patient, this long chain sometimes takes up to two months before they receive medical care. And this is a worldwide problem, not only specific to Russia. And But it's very important to bring patients around the patient and uh, to bring the doctors around the patient. On the one hand, you think it's expensive, uh, but think about uh, integrated patient unit and think about saving time. And uh, that is very important to bring specialists. For instance, if the patient has no specific back pain and uh, this is very helpful when you can do the manipulations and you can diagnose it and then if you organize such a team you can redistribute roles and look at the specialties that uh, can appear such as integrator of complex uh, medical care now we have physicians that reroute or refer patients for different examinations or there can be another specialty called as uh, the digital consultant or analytical consultant or an expert in data and informatics um, and so, so on. Of course, today, a doctor cannot specialize on his hard skills only. They should be a greater scope of competences and see any doctor should possess, including soft skills and communication skills. Today, health care system is very diverse. How the system can be impacted by the artificial intelligence. Daniel Kraft said that this is going to be of high relevance, and I think Paul talked about it yesterday as well. Doctors that use artificial intelligence are going to replace those that do not use artificial intelligence. So, good, but who will replace doctors that already use artificial intelligence? I believe it's a very important matter. Well, these doctors will be re replaced with nurses and lab workers, and they will be replaced by patients that use certain systems based on artificial intelligence. That means that any issue we 
have will start from a professor and then will be cascaded down uh, to the nurse, to assistant paramedic, etc., etc. And finally, it will be cascaded to the patient. As for arterial pressure, we know that long time ago there was, or it could be measured only by unique specialist. It was a very complex methodology, but today it can be measured easily at home by using different devices. So it was quite a challenging matter, but now we take it for granted that we can do it at home and it can be easily done by the patient himself. So, of course, change is going to be gradual, but finally we are going to pass on those difficult medical responsibilities uh, to uh, uh, all the to the chain down. Now look at the mobile phones. Everyone possesses them today. There is a great need for mobile phones and there is a high penetration of uh, phones across the population. But look at the number of doctors that use them in their work. Of course, medicine is a very conservative area, and but at the same time, it's very important to train specialists. And again, we are very conservative, and now we need to think how we can develop um, additional skills. Well, you see that uh, the need is increasing and also look at the number of examinations and it grows exponentially and of course if you look at the need and the number of doctors there is a a big uh, correlation and of course if there is a shortage of specialists they can b with high burden they can be a risk of a larger number of uh, mistakes and uh, we have today neurosurgeons who interpret the MRI results, right? Anesthesiologists that do function under the control, uh, control of ultrasound uh, methods and so on. So we need to combine today areas of expertise. And uh, it is good that they're able to perform diagnostics. It means that the patients will be able to receive the diagnose faster. One of the U.S. companies developed an application that allows a neurologist uh, immediately to receive a notification on his smartphone and see the images uh, with uh, areas uh, of a hematoma or stroke and based on this data make a decision. Of course, then you won't have to send uh, a description and uh, the the so doctor can decide whether he needs to visit the patients and do trampolysis and etc. etc. or what he, he can uh, leave the patient at trust. Uh, as for deficit of x-ray specialists, you can see there are countries where they do not have this specialist. However, equipment is available. And uh, why is this chart, import, uh, chart important? It means that uh, even if you provide a great amount of equipment, uh, you still won't be able to solve the problem because somebody needs to interpret data. And uh, this uh, is also important because uh, you, uh, we need to have a sufficient number of uh, doctors and uh, as for the doctors that decide to become x-ray specialists, uh, it's, uh, this situation is not going to impact their work in the very near future. However, it will impact the demand in those experts. And as we plan the procurement of equipment, we need to understand who will use this equipment and maybe we need to use different information systems. Now also look at the wait time uh, for examination results. Sometimes it takes uh, weeks or even longer and uh, people are not concerned about it if it's not an emergency situation you can have your MRI examination um, 
in one month if uh, uh, there is no large problem. However, in Moscow and in Russia, patients are very demanding and they're not always willing to wait for a month and we want to outpace Europe uh, uh, and if uh, we are able to uh, uh, in, uh, achieve uh, great results. We are, par we are proud of them. But look what happens in Great Britain or uh, Japan. Uh, some of uh, the X-ray uh, uh, X-ray images they are not described uh, by the special uh, specialists. And uh, I went to one of the clinics in Europe, and what I saw there, there are three doctors that that describe MRI results of brain, and you see the wait time for results is one month. It's impossible from my point of view. Of course, it's a great burden for those workers. They feel concerned, and one of them even experienced emotional uh, breakdown and uh, finally this doctor approached a professional pathologist and uh, she got a uh, sick leave for half a year because she had an emotional burn down and instead of having three doctors that clinic had only two for half a year and for them it was very important to engage another expert we understand that this hospital was kind of isolated but they could not engage someone from a different region can you imagine what a nightmare it was for patients they go through MRI examination and they wait for results for one month. So one of the solutions is uh, using information systems. That is when we can provide the best advice uh, to any patients by using central system. We have a centralized system here in Moscow, so all digital equipment in our outpatient clinics is connected to this system. That's this data available for 2019 and hundreds of patients can use this database, but of course we are going to replace some equipment. We are going to add equipment for um, mammography, for CT, for MRI, and so on. And hopefully, we, uh, the, as for 2021, 90% of the equipment will be digital. And um, this is good. So everything will be digitalized. And uh, we, are, we are looking at the design this is something what should change uh, diagnostic radiology and bring high level of comfort for patient as well as for doctors. And I hope th that the plans that we have are going to be carried out. They already been carried out uh, within the life cycle contracts. So that is when we buy equipment and service all together. Um, now we have already uh, uh, portable devices, portable um, uh, equipment, and uh, physicians will have an opportunity to make this research under the remote control of a specialist, because the uh, specialist can then monitor and then control remotely in some situations. And uh, that such solutions shouldn't be massive, of course. Let's give it that way, everybody. Everybody means to nobody. They should be pointed, targeted solutions to carry out specific research and examinations, automatic examinations, new methodologies here. For instance, 3D transmission uh, ultrasound, which uh, can be compared to MRI now on the quality of uh, and resolution. And uh, we might see that mammography was used to be 100 years before, and it will stay 100 years. But that's not uh, not so. New methods could come. New approaches could come. Of course, automated 3D uh, bre breast cancer uh, examinations could be an alternative. Comprehensive uh, examination methods using uh, CT in low doses of uh, uh, chest and uh, lungs and all the specialists know about it. They uh, send for low doses tomography, low doses tomography of uh, nose when uh, uh, we can get, have less uh, radiology lo load on uh, on uh, children, for instance. All protein screens, it's uh, coronary calcium, uh, uh, 
aortic expansion. It can all be done within the comprehensive uh, screening. What we shouldn't do the whole body scan, but uh, on the specific points, we should do automatic uh, sampling. And of course, we have algorithms based on AI, which are ready and able to detect uh, com different different figures, different parameters in the quantitative mode. Viktor Gombaleski and Anna Panina, who were not at the stand of our uh, X-ray labs, please come to it and you can see digital dis the, the detailed description of all this equipment. It's a wonderful stand of nurse for nurses and in an experiment uh, uh, way they uh, they uh, they proved that uh, the uh, this radiology can be done in three minutes. Of course, it's not the rise for the time, but the fact is that these uh, can be done very efficiently, and this is the way of organization. Pirogova Hospital. Uh, CT of the um, of the brains can done in three minutes. 100 patients a day is the throughput when uh, the lab uh, uh, assistant uh, places uh, the patient. Uh, the other specialist operates the whole process, and this proper organization increase, improves the efficiency. Low doses regime, radiomics, uh, detection of some uh, signs which are not always visible by eye, but visible for a computer when we can detect at the earlier stage that the small lesion is a tumor and uh, the doctor cannot see it, uh, cannot all see all the whole pathology. It uh, is in the future, of course, to be implemented, but it's very important that in the diagnostics we gradually start to move away from uh, a special and big uh, voluminous uh, description of the patient to specific figures. Now, urologists send patients uh, to PSA. Uh, I will not be surprised if uh, uh, after some years they will take pirates, as neurologists like to write T2 in the regime with the star, and they will write, the urologists will write an uh, examination by pirates. And the patient can get, uh, uh, can get also the uh, inscription for the hormonal therapy on radiological markers, as we call them. Uh, we can get from images and create them, standardized reports. Who will need all these uh, images? Of course, doctors will need them to carry out treatment and different projections in the uh, uh, surgery room. Planning of surgery is uh, on the images which can be easily embedded in the brains of young specialists. And the doctors who are now trained in uh, traumatology should have access to images to be able to plan surgeries, not by uh, the way of uh, X-ray uh, on uh, the windows and just, uh, well, uh, 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 selecting some, some, some elements or sockets for transplantation. But the PC modeling should be involved, very precise method. And just it's not possible just to give a methodology to specialists. Very few people are ready to uh, implement new technologies. It should be passed over through training process. It is better. We start to use uh, voice recognition technologies. The uh, printing problem, the print and description problem uh, can be solved. What is now used in outpatients departments, such microphones, uh, around 100 microphones already ordered for the outpatients, and uh, gradually all stations now order it for radiologists. Uh, the model can differ. It's uh, not a, a joystick, but a sensing panel to dictate, to dictate by voice uh, their opinions. And then it's going to be recognized by a special provider. And it's very easy that on this uh, equipment you can scroll up and down uh, different images. It already is used in Europe, and the company, one company, started to deliver it to Moscow institutions. And young specialists already catch up with this technology. They understand what the voice recognition is and how they can uh, pronounce their opinion in a more clear way to make it easier to get it into this system and be uh, introduced in the automatic protocol. Telemethodology reference center, it is already on the agenda. Now 3.5 consultings are done by our center a year and uh, doctors from other regions, from other centers can get the benefit of this system and EMEAS-ERIS system 
can solve this problem of uh, inavailability of an expert. In a distant format, will be used not for the second opinion, but for the preliminary description. When in one place, a uh, lab specialist made a uh, screening and examination, and in the other place, it's been it's been described. Of course, it drastically increases the requirement for uh, X-ray operators who start from breast cancer, tomography, CT, and, and probably MRI, they can do it on their own and then pass over the results to the doctor, to the specialist for the description. It will change, and we will, coming back to the beginning, it will change the profile of our specialists. Why, given the uh, computer technologies, the sub-specialization is needed. It's not necessary to change the name of the position. Professional standards allow to combine different professional skills and functions and to make subspecializations here, because the federal center carried out uh, an examination. None of the federal center or private clinic has the full set of experts. Uh, the materials can be given to the specialist who is the subject matter expert in the area and get the uh, most precise diagnosis. And spectrum and spectrum are changing inside diagnostics too. Can uh, artificial intelligence replace different areas. Well, we already mentioned uh, the areas where it can help improve the quality of images, reduce time of uh, uh, studies, of examinations, provide automated analysis of data, provide screening. Well, a lot of different things. I'm not going to go into detail. So the future is in the development of medical specializations, in uh, mastering new functions, and an um, absolutely different approach to organization of medical help. Simulation and mod modeling will work very well here, and you can see it at the next door stand. Online training, uh, remote education systems, uh, which are also provided also by our center, and skills and uh, development and management skills development in medicine. What is going to be in future? The future is already there. It is just uh, not um, equally distributed, as someone says. But I try to reflect best practices in my presentation. Many thanks for your attention. Sergey, many thanks to you. And despite that uh, now we have a lot of trends in uh, the world, not only in business, also in economics, in the uh, it's maximum 10 minutes for presentation for every speaker now, normally. But but today we have the session where we won't have enough three hours and still we will have a very many interesting presentations. Uh, dear friends, um, it, would very, it would be good um, that the patient uses artificial intelligence and not uh, the other way around. Second, we have a mem around uh, radiology and x-ray. There is a joke when the patient comes, it happens very often, uh, what, what happens to you? I want everything. I want to understand what happens to me. And here's the button, total body scan. And we want to scan everything. And the outcome, we don't see anything. 326. Uh, it, I'm surprised. It's very great. We should also compete in F1 race, maybe, with the timing. Because when once I, uh, I had... Uh, uh, I, I was involved in radiology. I had a practice in Göteborg. I paid attention that the, the doctor doesn't approach. It was 10 years ago. The, uh, this, the doctor is not involved. He is just does what he has to do. And one more thing, uh, and we will discuss it. Sergei, you mentioned very good that cardiologists in particular evaluate whether it's about uh, endovascular uh, surgery, TAVI valves, or uh, we, we look uh, and describe uh, images on our own, but uh, of course we can consult the specialist, and we will consult the specialist, neurologist. You help us a lot in that, and this is a collective work. Be, uh, till millimeters precision which can cost the life of a patient, and this is great that the, it is mentioned. And of course we will discuss technologies which uh, exist. Unfortunately, we don't have much time. And now I'd like to address the floor to Paul. Please, you have the floor. Many thanks, Konstantin. I'm going to speak in English, and uh, I hope that you... Could you... Uh, do you have the, the clicker? We're going to talk about uh, a slightly different uh, approach, and I'm very grateful to my friend Sergei for inviting me and uh, for... Um, for laying the foundation, and you will see 
I, my talk is scheduled uh, a little bit differently. We are going to talk about the future of diagnostic radiology. And um, we are going to show some images. I do have some disclosures because I am working with uh, some of the companies. The thing is that radiology is the fastest growing discipline in all of medicine. And I think we have a very bright future ahead of us. We have a future that is so bright that sometimes we don't believe ourselves. We have to put on uh, sunglasses. And we are going, as Sergei very eloquently showed, entering a new world. But we are also subject to a number of threats. And I think that we must change with times. We must evolve in the way we generate pictures, analyze pictures, develop new techniques, go to uh, functional imaging instead of looking at morphology. We should be the eyes of the surgeons or the clinicians. We must develop, um, we must be aware of the economy, which is something that in the old days was never a problem for radiologists, and we must embrace artificial intelligence. So changing with the times, um, radiology has been characterized by one of the fastest rates of change. I am uh, maybe a little bit older than most of you, but when I look at my training, this is what I trained to do as a radiologist. This is what I spent the first three years of my training learning. All of these techniques are now no longer uh, valid. Um, the um, intravenous uh, urography has been replaced by ultrasound or CT. Um, the um, barium enema is a thing of the past, fortunately. Uh, all of these techniques are no longer used. I'm trying to move ahead here. Uh, all of these techniques are no longer used. We don't use um, barium to examine the stomach. We don't do arthrography anymore. That was an art. We do no longer do pulmonary angiography to look for pulmonary emboli, that is CT. We almost never do myelography, except when there are some contraindications. We don't use barium contrast or iodine contrast to look at the intestine, and we don't do lymphography anymore. This, is, this was my world for the first three years of my training, and all of that has disappeared. All of that has gone. What we have done is that we have evolved from making two-dimensional pictures to 3D data sets. And this is an example in point. We have moved from looking at the skull x-ray to a 3D data set that allows us to look at the skin structures, the hair, what lies underneath. Um, we can move in three dimensions with these images. Now, this may look like, uh, like um, the future, but it's actually also useful. If we look at the child with a funny looking head, we can start looking at the outside of the head. We can peel away the skin. We can look at the sutures and we see very clearly that there is one of the sutures that has closed prematurely, which is growing the, the skull in an abnormal way. So this is not just a game. This helps us to understand processes. We have and we will continue to develop new techniques. Uh, the images are a little bit squished, but here are uh, techniques showing the middle ear structures. These are small bones inside the middle ear that are just a few millimeters in diameter. We are able to identify them very delicately, and we are able to help, as I will show a little further, the surgeons uh, to uh, prepare for an operation. We can look at the structures of the neck we can not only examine bones, but we can examine the arteries, the carotid artery, the, the internal jugular vein, the external jugular vein. We can look at the joints. We can get all of this information with a few clicks of our data sets. We um, have moved from looking at the, the colon, that's the big intestine, uh, from using barium to CT-driven techniques where we fill the intestine with air and we have a contrast layer and we can have even travel through this in what we call virtual reality. It's a virtual endoscopy. We're not actually going inside the bowel, but we do that with imaging techniques. So, so um, we look at the brain and this is my area of interest. This is a data set produced by one of my former PhD students. We look at the brain and we can see the white matter tracts. We can look inside the brain without having to cut open the skull and we can see all of this information and look for abnormal connections. 
um, and we can do that in very, very high resolution, showing abnormalities in the corpus callosum of a patient with multiple sclerosis. We can assess the lesions. We can know where they are, how big they are, and all of this information. We have also gone from simply making images to trying to understand functional imaging. On the left is a chest x-ray. All of you have had a chest x-ray in their lives. On the right is the same kind of image looking at the chest, but with a an CT and geography technique that shows us the heart, the big vessels, the kidneys, etc. cetera, uh, in a patient uh, with an abnormality of the aorta in this case. But we can use this uh, to see in 3D what is going on with the patient. We can use it to teach anatomy to medical students. On the left is a, is an, a picture taken from an anatomy book of a medical student. We have already 20 years ago started to produce these images, but now we can actually move these images. We can travel together with the blood vessels. We can start in the abdomen looking at the aorta. We can look at the kidneys. We can look at the iliac vessels. We can look all the way down. We see the occlusion of one of the knee arteries, the popliteal artery, and we can track this only in a few seconds with just a very small amount of contrast medium and with a very, very high quality CT scanner and we can get this information. Um, we can um, go beyond images to actually look at the bio biochemical structure of the brain doing spectroscopy, looking at normal tissues, comparing them with tumors and having an idea about the amount of choline, the amount of cell membrane turnover that is happening inside the brain and to determine whether a lesion is actually fast developing, highly malignant, or whether it's slowly growing, more benign. And that tells us something about the treatment for this patient, if that patient will need aggressive treatment or more conservative treatment. We must be the eyes of the surgeons, of the clinicians, of the cardiologists. Uh, we can not only identify fractures, but in this case, on the right video animation, you can see that a fracture, a small amount of bone, has protruded into the spinal canal. We can tell the surgeon exactly where that is, where they have to take it away, how big the dissection should be, how big the incision should be. And we can do the same thing for other kinds of uh, surgery. For example, in this case, the middle ear surgery. This is a patient with a cholesteatoma, which is a very frequent benign, slowly growing, expanding tumor of the middle ear that is compressing the bones. And in the animations, you can see that the cholesteatoma is sort of greenish blue, and the surgeon understands exactly what is the relation between this lesion and the ossicles so that you can operate and the patient still has a chance to hear normally after this is uh, done. One thing is that we must also develop economically feasible models to help patients in remote locations. And I think this is a big challenge. I, since a few months, I am working in Australia. Australia is a very big country. If you look at the overlay on the left side, that's Australia overlaid on uh, Europe. And you can see on the right a composition showing that Australia is basically like France and Germany and Poland and the United Kingdom and many, many other countries put together. And um, interestingly, when you look at Russia, you have the same kind of geography, and it's a very, very big challenge. And uh, I took the opportunity, I hope, Sergei, that you don't mind, that uh, in public, I'm going to give you something for inviting me. So that you remember that when you come to Australia, that there are, that there are some, uh, yeah, great that there are some, uh, some similarities between Australia and Russia, absolutely. And this is a big challenge because we need to provide services not only to the patients that are living in Moscow. We need to provide services not only to the patients that are living in Perth or Sydney. We must have remote diagnostics for patients living in small cities and even small villages, and we can do that. And how we can do that now is with artificial intelligence solutions, and electronic communication. We use artificial intelligence to detect changes that are invisible to the naked eye. And one of the first examples, and it has been mentioned by Constantin, is uh, how to detect acute stroke in patients. You can use software. 
you can communicate to neurologists as the information can decide uh, automatically almost uh, whether to um, do something with the patient, whether to intervene or not. We show, we have software that will identify hemorrhage inside the brain. Uh, Sergei has showed an image. This is a magnified image, four different patients where the software analyzes this and automatically sends us a series with the little yellow arrows indicating small amounts of hemorrhage. This may look like very insignificant, but it has very big ramifications and it changes the management of the patient. Um, we can use it by characterizing lesions and comparing lesions to a library of known tumors. And this is software that was developed in China uh, at the Tiantan Hospital uh, by my friend Yao Liu in conjunction with a Singapore company. So you segment out a lesion, a patient in this case with a tumor in the fourth ventricle, and uh, you compare this against a library, against an encyclopedia of known tumors, and you get a label, and the label says, hello, my name is medulloblastoma, that's the diagnosis. And the accuracy now already is better than for most average radiologists. I'm not talking about super specialists, but I'm talking about the average radiologist. They don't have that experience. AI can give that experience. We can provide quantitative imaging data, and this is work that was done by one of my PhD students, simply going from images, put them in a computer, and then uh, get an output, and this output is annotated images where you can measure the volume of the gray matter, where you can measure the volume of white matter lesions, and you can compare that, again, data sets of a previous examination with the current examination to show the evolution of lesions in a patient, in this case with multiple sclerosis, with multiple white matter lesions inside the brain. This should not be done by humans because this is very time consuming. If I have to do that to make the comparison, I spend about 15, 20 minutes simply to try to look at the differences. If you are less experienced, you need more time. There is software available and this software, and I'm very uh, happy that uh, Professor Morosov has shown you uh, an image, a uh, similar image. This software can actually give a structured report, can communicate with the neurologist and in a much, much better way than the average radiologist would do that. And the, the structured report gives you information about the current scan, the previous scan, the previous, previous scan, and uh, in different anatomic regions. And you have a structured report with numbers that tells you if the patient is responding to the therapy or not responding to the therapy. It's really an important information. And, um, we use the same thing also in, to predict Alzheimer's disease. Sergei has shown that uh, people are getting older, living longer. Um, Alzheimer's disease is a very, very big problem. We know that we can predict the evolution to Alzheimer's disease by looking at certain structures in the deep part of the brain, which is the hippocampus, and we can look at these, uh, we can segment out these images and have a prediction uh, on whether patients are at risk or not at risk to uh, develop Alzheimer's disease. And we use all this also, and this has been shown by Professor Morozov to streamline the patient workflow, to prioritize emergency cases in the work list and develop uh, electronic communication data. And this is an example where in the work list that the radiologist is seeing, the radiologist knows automatically, I first have to look at this patient because this is urgent and this will impact on the treatment. So we think that AI already now is helping by decreasing the time that it takes radiologists to make a report or to commu communicate with clinicians, but very important economic advantages. It has been shown that use of AI decreases the length of stay in the emergency department by up to one hour. It decreases the inpatient hospital length of stay by 15 to 20 percent. So if you use AI, communication is much faster. And we have increased detection rates for a number of diseases, intracranial hemorrhage, pulmonary embolism, subtle fractures of the spine or the ribs. So AI will not replace radiologists, but radiologists who do not use it will be replaced by those who do. So this was very technical, lots of images, very fast in English, but what should you remember? I want you to remember four points. And my four points is this. One, radiology has a bright future and will continue to help patients 
but it will undergo changes. And the pace of this change is very, very fast, much faster now than it has ever been in the past. Second point, radiology is not just about x-ray or scanners or whatever. We use different techniques, we use different energy, we use different methods, and we try to integrate all of these methods and to make the best choice in one patient for which technique to choose. Three, artificial intelligence is going to assist radiologists. And I made a comment yesterday for those who were there or those who were not there, artificial intelligence is to medicine what a GPS system or your Yandex on your smartphone, what it is to the driver of a car. You use the Yandex to find your way to know that you should not take Tverskaya Ulitsa because there's a big traffic jam and that you should better go along the Olympiski Prospect rather than Prospect Mira because there is a problem there. So this is what artificial intelligence is going to do to radiologists and it's a, it's a very important tool. And my fourth point is, is that radiology is not no longer just about images. It's about quantitative image analysis, it's about structured reporting, and it's about communicating data, numbers, facts, with clinicians, and not just opinions based on imaging. And um, in my lifetime, we have moved from black and white television, as you can see in the top left-hand corner, to color TV. And I remember my grandparents, when they first saw color TV, they didn't like it. They thought it was too expensive, and they didn't think that there would be anything that they could see on color TV that they didn't see on black and white TV. We have to overcome the inertia, the resistance of the medical community, which is very, very conservative against changes. And I uh, would like to conclude here and uh, be very happy to take any questions that you have. Thank you very much, Paul. It was very informative, and uh, of course, uh, it's a great skill to provide so much in such a little amount of time. While you are thinking, uh, dear friends, about your questions, and I believe there are many because this is a very interesting subject, I would like to touch upon two issues. Uh, we will talk about artificial intelligence a bit later, but let's talk about more practical matters. Why are technologies so important? Four days ago, the Heart magazine published a very, very interesting article from Seoul, and we know that uh, South Korea right now enjoys uh, a very um, high level of development in radiology and so on. So there was a case described, 44-year-old uh, woman was admitted with symptoms of uh, uh, with suspicion of cervical uh, uh, a disease and they did a pet simonium, tomography and they also looked at a fraction reserve and then they also looked at the lumen of the vessel and they understood there was a clot and they saw that the clot was large uh, and it would occlude 70% of the vessel but it was occluded only 55% and uh, then in certain period of time they saw after medical treatment the clot lot was gone and uh, this successful treatment uh, was possible due to these uh, great uh, advancements in technologies and we understand that endovascular treatment is not always necessary. So these technologies are of great help for us and I first will address the question to you, Sergey, and then to Paul. So in your opinion, what technologies will uh, help us in cardiology and urology and uh, what so what are the most important technologies that will help us develop in these two areas cardiology and urology thank you very much Constantine for me it is a very large question actually if you look at the potential of existing methods it's not fully depleted if you look at MRI if you look at examinations of brain there are many possibilities and uh, 
you just need to understand the full scope that the methods offer. Paul showed that the images of our brain look at spectroscopy that right now goes through different stages of development. Sometimes, you know, people feel disappointed about it, then they feel more enthusiastic. Computer tomography, uh, fractional reserve of blood flow. You can do the calculation by using computer tomography. You also, as for ultrasound diagnostics, uh, it also can offer a lot. Very often uh, we talk about the U.S. experience. Yesterday we talked a lot about screening and uh, uh, we uh, s talked a lot about what they do in the U.S. But in uh, the U.S. there is not a proper screening program of uh, breast cancer. Or they often talk about treading nuclear diagnostics there, cardiologists use a SPAC a lot. And in Russia, I believe that here we are more focused on uh, functional diagnostics, uh, stress tech, uh, etc. And uh, for MRI, for myocardium, for heart is offered even in ordinary clinics. So there are many methods uh, uh, that still can be utilized in terms of of, um, the future methods that have been so far analyzed, uh, PAP is something, uh, PET is something what you have mentioned. We know that PET is uh, used for oncology. As for this year, uh, we started rolling out PET uh, program in Moscow within uh, uh, state medical insurance. If you look at demand of Moscow, we need to carry out 75,000 uh, examinations. So, uh, uh, but the medical insurance fund offers uh, a coverage of 60,000 for next year. We also can offer similar examination uh, for rheumatology of, uh, diseases, etc., etc. So, PET examination is uh, relevant, uh, it has high potential, but we need to provide the proper training. When we offered PET technology, we cannot say that it was immediately welcomed by oncologists. And uh, I, when I talked to uh, many specialists, they said, we know what PET CT is about, we attend conferences, but when it comes to prescribing uh, PET CT to a particular um, patient, they would rather opt for MRI and not for this uh, technology because there is a stereotype, stereotype that we need to overcome. As for the learning curve of oncologists, it was very important. It was very important uh, to provide training so they would embrace all the technologies and they would understand when you prescribe this uh, or the other uh, technology. So you need to provide uh, uh, good uh, scope of training and also I understand that all more bile tools are going to be of high relevance uh, for ultrasound for instance and MRI monitoring also can be done with the use of uh, digital technologies and uh, we can engage um, People, if you use tele, uh, we can engage various uh, experts from uh, different areas and uh, have them help their colleagues remotely. So we understand that this is going to uh, gadget that can become a, for, uh, a modern phonendoscope. And we remember there was there were times when phonendoscope was not available for every doctor. Right now, in um, intensive uh, care units, cardiologists use ultrasound for focus heart examination just to see uh, the presence of uh, free liquid uh, in pericardium etc etc so mobile technologies nuclear medical technologies and analytical methods something was uh, uh, what was shown by Paul so uh, we, for instance, at the moment do not uh, have a device that will show the dynamics of all the uh, clots, but how do doctors do uh, work today? They try to measure something, but you cannot just do a visual examination saying, okay, the clot has increased or decreased, or there is a positive trend, or I see, it, or I see positive dynamics. Of course, you see uh, this... Methods are going to be very helpful and uh, 
Paul already showed uh, the quantitative, quantitative methods. They are going to provide a huge breakthrough and will make doctors more confident in their decision. Because very often doctors uh, today, they rely on the ultrasound specialists uh, because they are more accurate, especially when it comes to our valve, right? Of course. And... Uh, so it's very important to standardize the measurements to make sure that we are less dependent on a human error. And for instance, today you work with a certain um, radiologist and tomorrow he's on vacation. And what do you do then? Or he moves to work to another clinic. So it's very important. Okay, thank you very much, Sergey Pavlovich. So it is a great uh, bridge. And now I would like to pass the floor to Paul. Correct me if I am wrong. You, I think in 1930s, uh, Warburg understood, uh, Warburg saw that uh, glucose is included in tumor tissue, and then Dr. Sokolov also studied this uh, issue, and uh, there was a discovery when Phelps was able to measure all this, and it was a huge breakthrough. But now we know there are many methods, uh, and it is good as for degenerative changes in Russia we start talking about it uh, from 1950s so when it comes to brain studies what hybrid technologies will help us in studying Alzheimer's diseases and other degenerative diseases well we don't we don't know exactly so far we don't have um a very specific imaging um, diagnosis for Alzheimer's disease. I think that um, the combination of different methods is going eventually to be the way to the future. And I think different methods, we should think not only about imaging, and this is what I've been saying for a number of years, it's not only about radiology and radiologists. I think we have to be in a very broad diagnostic platform. Um, the future, of course, is that radiology and nuclear medicine will become one force, that they will be one platform available to the patient. And I think, and we are actually working on that, is that also pathology and clinical biology and liquid biopsy will be all different aspects of the same clinical spectrum. As you know, with Alzheimer's disease, there's a number of biochemical markers, there's a number of genetic markers, and then the genetic markers, the biological markers, are modulated probably by local circumstances, and that's something that we can look at with imaging. So far, with Alzheimer's disease, in terms of imaging, the two techniques that we use are MRI and PET. And there are certain uh, indirect techniques, such as CT, which allow you to assess the volume of the, the hippocampal tissue. But if you ask me, my personal opinion, I think in Alzheimer's disease, the answer is not going to come from imaging, but is probably going to come from clinical biology and genetics. Thank you very much, dear friends. Any questions? Can I say a few words I would like to ask uh, Paul? Uh, there was a very interesting uh, slide in your presentation at the very beginning. You showed the methods that are already gone. And actually, you were talking about conservative approach of a medical community. And you know, I counteracted my personal dilemma when I finally understood that I'm also a conservative person. I have a very uh, difficult question. You know, on one hand, I'm very interested in innovations and suddenly I understood that I'm a conservative person. Well, the question is, what X-ray machines should outpatient clinics buy in the near future? And all my colleagues said that, of course, this should be machines with a fluoroscopy function. And then my colleagues told, asked me, why do you need them? Why will you need them? I asked, why? How? How can I work without them? There should be at least one machine in outpatient clinic with fluoroscopy and they asked me but what uh, 
the statistics show us, and statistically it turned out that less than 10,000 uh, examinations were made by, for, for more than 80 outpatients departments, only 10,000 examinations, very small number a year in the scope of the whole city. We started to take a look what was these examinations and we, it turned out that these were examinations as Paul showed can be replaced. Then I turned to my colleagues. The colleagues told me, nevertheless, that no, no, of course we need this uh, uh, X-ray machine with fluoroscopy. As a result, we came to a conclusion that we need to have uh, ex equipment very high quality, X-ray equipment with different functionalities of stitching, whatever. Uh, of course, digital. And uh, fluoroscopy should be uh, there only in hospitals, in, in stationary departments. Okay. And my question is, where should we pre be prepared for in the future? What uh, method next will go, will go away? Well, thank you, Sergei. The, I'm going to, like, with any difficult question in an examination, a student tries to tell the professor something else. So I'm going to try to, to tell you something else. I think that where we are going in the future are three things. And one is we're going from using ionizing radiation to using less and less ionizing radiation. The techniques without ionizing radiation are now ultrasound and MRI, but there is something that is being used somewhat like optical coherence tomography. There may be other energies, but we will be using less and less ionizing radiation. I think, two, we should ask ourselves if we even have to have a radiologic clinic in the future. Because I think the evolution is that we will bring imaging techniques to the bedside, to the patient. I think that already today there are many other uh, methods, like in clinical biology, where you have something that is called point of care. You, you, you measure at the point of care in the contact with the patient. There is an evolution now that um, there is a small handheld MRI system that could be developed to look uh, at the bedside of the patient. Ultrasound can be done at the bedside of the patient. X-ray can be done at the bedside of the patient. Um, we see that uh, in my previous hospital in Antwerp that we were doing a lot, a lot, a lot of uh, portable X-ray and we had machines with automated detection of pneumothorax, automated detection of a number of other things. So the technologists that went to the patient, they could already make the diagnosis there at the bedside and without the patient having to come to the radiology clinic. And um, the whole concept of what is a radiology department, uh, I've seen this change over the past 40 years. Um, it is not so long ago that in a radiology department we had to have dark rooms and developing equipment for film, etc. I think the whole concept of a radiology department is that we will try to move more and more away from the big machines, which are, you know, a CT scan and an MR is not very patient friendly. It's a little bit, uh, it's a frightening experience for many patients. I never realized that. And until I remember that my mom needed an MRI of her neck and she became very claustrophobic and she was crying when she came out and she said it was an experience for me like I was lying in my coffin because you are in a tunnel, there is not a lot of space, it is not a very pleasant experience to be there. So how fast this is going to happen, Sergei, I don't know. Um, but I would agree with your um, with your uh, suggestion that heavy X-ray equipment should be stratified and that I fully agree that fluoroscopy and other uh, such techniques should be limited to hospitals. And I think that if you can have a remote clinic with simply an, an X-ray machine making a, a digital image with some artificial intelligence software to analyze that, that this is a very, very good uh, step forward. And it makes it all cheaper, simpler, less dangerous than having to have fluoroscopy there. Thank you very much, Paul. It's a very important point, by the way. And uh, in, in connection to what you said, I wanted to point out two more things. Uh, the lifelong uh, attributive risk everyone is concerned 
uh, this uh, radiation is imaging uh, we keep discussing it and every good radiologist very good doctor uh, always uh, mentions uh, this flight from Moscow to New York uh, about this attributive risk is there any difference because there are studies also in our country as far as I know my uh, 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 colleague Ivanov in Obninsk made this CT and uh, MRI, he made these studies. Sergey, I wanted to listen to your opinion. What are the developments in this? In low doses uh, CT, will it really help us? Thank you, Konstantin. Well, everything has become uh, uh, more safe. Uh, I'm sure. But by the way, here in the room, uh, please raise hands those who are not specialists in the medical sphere, in the medical area. All others are doctors, medical doctors. Then please, uh, medical specialists, please raise your hands. Very good. Then fine. So our discussion is then very professional. OK. The thing is that, of course, modern equipment have become quite safe. Uh, X-ray machine reproduced several years ago on uh, the drawings of uh, the early years of the century gives 100% higher irradiation com compared to modern equipment. What we use now is just tiny doses. Of course, it's higher than the flight from Moscow to New York or New York, Moscow back uh, several times. Well, but uh, these machines have become safer. Of course, the uh, question of using these machines. Uh, so far in Russia, we don't have uh, systems of automated or distant calculation and analysis of dosages which patients get using this equipment. Although there are such systems in the world, and uh, I hope that uh, with support of our center, they will come to Russia too. They will allow to see at what machine and uh, by what specialist the doses are exaggerated are too high because they say okay let's scan a little bit more let's take the child and uh, a chronic pancreas, pancreas let's make a multi-stage equipment and uh, well we will include some more things there as you uh, cite an example when the patient comes i don't know what so let's take the total blood discount okay and let's find these extremities these outlying uh, values where we have uh, too high doses versus all other equipments. These uh, examinations should be then reduced. Why? Because there were cases in uh, the U.S. when uh, patients accepted with uh, the aneurysma breaches with subchondral uh, hemorrhages in uh, the brain in order to detect the stage of uh, Vaza spasm creation, and uh, after this hemorrhage, the ischemic stroke can happen. To catch this moment, the patients uh, underwent uh, almost daily perfusion examinations, and uh, they got uh, the uh, problems with their hairs in the, in in, in uh, these um, uh, regions where perfusion uh, examinations were done. What was wrong? There were no problem with the equipment. Everything was fine. But the use, the methodology was not in line with the recommendations. It was an experimental examination, of course. And of course, specialists and doctors were wrong in making this over irradiation. And uh, if you know the US system, you can expect huge suits uh, to these uh, clinics because these are problems with hair at first and what ca happens in 10 years, a glioblastoma or brain cancer. Uh, well, of course it should be controlled and information systems are a big support in this regard. Viktor Ivanov is developing methodologies of individual risk which we can communicate with the patient and so far it's not so clear here I'd like uh, Paul to uh, comment how uh, but, uh, this risk can be communicated to the patients without uh, taking the reference to the flight but just to uh, explain whether it's high doses or low doses whether it's too much or too few and shall we also calculate the accumulative doses for the patient itself what is the best practice Paul what is your opinion and just excuse me I will add uh, in our country there's a big protocol of uh, oncophobia oncophobia research we can compare it a little bit because people are very very scared about it. Uh, I, will, I will use an analogy. Um, 
when I was um, when I was a young man, when I was a student, on when we had vacation, we would go to Spain or Italy or Turkey, and you had a good vacation when you came brown when you came back completely brown, when you were in the sunshine and uh, it was a sign of health to be brown. I now live in Australia, where every day, walking to work, getting out of the car, I wear a hat. I've even gotten to the point that I wear a hat inside, uh, because people don't want to be in the sunshine, because they know in Australia very well that there is a risk of sunshine associated with the development of skin cancer melanoma. The same is more or less true, I think, in radiology. Uh, there, was, um, there was a time when we were doing um, barium studies and all kinds of fluoroscopy studies, nobody cared about the radiation dose. I remember that in difficult procedures, sometimes, in, especially in angiography the, and also in cardiology, as you will know, Constantin, sometimes the patient had erythema uh, from, uh, from prolonged radiation. Now um, we try to put in place a system where the radiation dose has to be registered in the radiology report. In Europe, this is a little bit easier because there has been a European Commission directive in 2013 that went into effect in January 1st, 2019, saying that there is mandatory registration of radiation dose for all patients undergoing examinations with ionizing radiation. And I think that if you develop such a system, the, the key is to have that information automatically injected into the radiology information system and into the report so that also the clinician knows what is the cum cumulative dose that the patient has already received in a certain amount of given time. And I think that the, the guideline should be that any radiation that can be avoided should be avoided. And then the, what, what Sergei mentioned about individual, the second guideline is that the older you get, the less important it becomes because these effects are usually effects that take delay with, with uh, sometimes 10, 20, 30 years. So if you get some radiation when you are 60 years old, it is much less important than when you get the same radiation when you are a child. There are other questions from the audience. I think we can start considering them. Uh, when implementing nanotechnologies in AI, uh, will we, won't we uh, face the total degradation of diagnosis in the young generation? A wonderful question. Sergei, will, will you start? A wonderful question. I did like it. Well, I think we should, uh, GP, uh, we should dis, uh, develop GPS concept. When we want to go somewhere, we automatically open our Yandex or Google to check whether we have a traffic jam on Tverskaya Street or Prospect Mira. And uh, sometimes we don't understand how should we use the map, which uh, we used to have uh, in uh, the compartment uh, uh, that just we should open and flip through. This uh, skill we lost now, how to use the, the, the paper-based map, right? And now I'm surprised when, when I come to a conclusion that I open a map, whatever, without any advertising, I open a map, when basically I know the way, but I still open it just in case maybe I can come faster or something, I can get a better way. It's a very important point. It will not lead to degradation. It may come to Alzheimer disease because to avoid Alzheimer, you should always take the new way, new route, and there are such studies in this uh, area. So it is very important sometimes to break the pattern, to get rid of any automation, sometimes to change your route and uh, explore some new way. Well, it's a disputable question, of course, but still, I believe it is the release, release of time, uh, the release of, uh, well, the brain of person. Uh, the person is a human being, is uh, the human being can use uh, this time and this effort in, for, for other tasks, not to do analysis of all these routine things, routine uh, characters, but think more about differential diagnosis. Okay, well, now 40% of error is just missed pathology. Okay, let the system give a hint, show better where to find, uh, where to seek for, and the man will then uh, lose, and will then lose cognitive tasks. 
Sergei, Sergei mentioned it all, but just one more, one more answer to your question. If you take that airplane from, uh, from Moscow, from uh, Sheremetyevo or Domodedovo to New York, there is a 90% chance that your pilot will land the plane on an autopilot. So it's not the human. But in 10% of cases, or 15%, I don't know, the pilots still have to do a manual landing. So it is clear that in all routine flights, it's actually the computer that is landing the plane and doing it in most cases better than the individual pilot. But there is a rule that the pilots will have to do it once in a while. And who knows, maybe also in, uh, in diagnostic radiology, we should have a rule that you could use artificial intelligence in 90% of cases or 80% of cases, but in 10 or 20%, you will have to do it yourself simply to stay, uh, to stay active and, and to prevent uh, your brain from shrinking. Thank you very much, Paul. After your answer and after these questions, I uh, understood that we just uh, miss Kangaroo and Elon, Elon Musk, who should also uh, give an answer about this total, complete navigation everywhere. We have one more question. Just quickly, I will comment on this situation. You know, the world is so open. There are so many, so much information, and it's wonderful. It's great. We all understand that. We just lost a little bit the critical thinking skill. The critical thinking skill is lost by young, by youth because the whole information should be processed. And this is uh, this differential diagnostics. What we are talking about. And uh, it was a very interesting study. Simple books were compared to e-books. And it turned out that normal books are much more useful in terms of uh, degeneration development because e-books don't, don't help. This sub-analysis will come after some time, of course, in more detail, but there are such issues already in consideration. Okay, dear friends, next question. What future of radiology in Russia, not in Moscow? Sergei, please. Okay, Paul, you as a specialist from Australia, what is uh, the, um, the future of radiology not in Moscow, but in, in the country? I think in what I see in Australia, I, I've lived most of my life in Belgium. Belgium is the Malinke, huh? it's very, very small. And in Belgium, you, you have a, a hospital every, every 10 kilometers, you can go everywhere. I think the big challenge, uh, Politically, and we had a meeting uh, a month ago with the Minister of Health of the state of Western Australia. The big challenge for a country like Australia, and I think the same thing for Moscow, uh, for uh, Russia, is to try to provide the same level of health care to people wherever they live. In Australia, people that are living in a small city that is a two hour flight out of Perth or out of Sydney. They should not be punished for living there. Uh, we should try to help them. And I think that the way to help them is to have um, high quality equipment, not too specialized, but basic high quality equipment, and have a strong data link so that interpretation of images, um, advice on how to perform the studies, direct communication with specialists could work. And I think this will be a way to, to even out the balance. Because I think now in Australia, really good example is uh, myocardial infarctions or stroke care. You have a bet much better chance of a good outcome if you are living in a big city. And um, often a lot of time is lost in remote areas in making the correct diagnosis. Australia, as you know, has something that is called the Royal Flying Doctor Service. They are very good, but they can only intervene if they know when and which patient they should get. And I think that is something that, you know, imaging, radiology, nuclear medicine, mammography, ultrasound, whatever, can help to identify patients that would benefit from immediate medical attention. And also in that way, prevent uh, useless interventions and doing too many uh, useless things. But I couldn't imagine that Paul is uh, so much involved in Russian healthcare. After he was involved, he was sent to Australia then afterwards. Well, absolutely. I, I agree absolutely that uh, basic, uh, basic types of medical care should be there where people live. It should be small uh, villages, small towns, but in general, 
the future of uh, Russian diagnostics, of course, is versatile because uh, the increment is uh, due to separate expertise and knowledge centers in Novosibirsk, in Kazan, in other cities. In Kazan, Voronezh, and in other cities. Uh, where they have provide the very high level of medical aid. The question is uh, how to provide medical aid to remote locations where patients are. Yes, we have a question. Is there a deficit of doctors that uh, are able to use uh, equipment in small cities? I will ask you in the following way, are there any changes in our education system? Because we can say that uh, uh, some time ago, many of the best doctors underwent training uh, in the different universities. Many got back, and uh, as we improve in our education system. Thank you very much, Konstantin. As for the program of interregional forums, uh, is uh, really uh, successful and uh, we hold our forums in different uh, cities in Kazan, Rizan, Chilabinsk and other cities. I can tell you that people are hungry for knowledge and uh, we can see that hundreds of people attend our lectures and they want to learn as much as possible eager to communicate with our top experts so there is a high level of enthusiasm and they bring x-ray specialists, ultrasound specialists, because they need uh, manual skills and they need to improve them constantly. But we need to offer more simulation trainings uh, in different regions, because we cannot just engage specialists and bring them here to Moscow. On the contrary, we should have our experts go to those regions, and that will help us extrapolate the knowledge and provide trainings. And and this system has been in place, and uh, at some point we experienced certain economic issues, but uh, right now we have a good regional program, and uh, we can say that it is in demand. Yes, Moscow is oversaturated with various kind of events, while regions lack them, and we have uh, situations when uh, our experts uh, go to a region to give a lecture and then we find among attendees, for instance, people coming from Armenia or other CIS countries because they also need to receive knowledge. So the last question, we have five or four minutes left. Yes, there are more questions. Okay. Dear Sergey, talking about the future of radiology, we understand that part of work should be done by artificial intelligence. Now in Moscow, uh, as for X-ray specialists, there is a shortage of them. How are you going to increase the number, uh, given the fact that earlier they were able to retire uh, at an early age? Well, first, thank you very much for the question. First of all, the professional conditions for X-ray lab workers, uh, this should stay the same. And uh, if uh, the conditions have changed, we need to revise it to analyze the situation. And it's very important to um, uh, as for the doctors, they are not in contact with the source of ionizing radiation, while lab workers are in, in contact with it. Secondly, we can interact more people if we offer more adequate pay. Right now, lab workers earn less than a surgical nurse, so their work is underestimated. Underestim and, of course, this is discouraging. One thing is when the head doctor of a clinic understands the value of this work, work and motivates financially uh, these workers because you can offer additional contracts and you can pay more according to the workload. But yes, lab workers are in deficit. There is a shortage of them. And uh, you know, when we have come up with modernization plans, there was no plan to increase the number of radiation lab workers. In Moscow right now, we have uh, a pilot uh, faculty for um, 
uh, extra lab workers. The mayor of this city would like us to increase the number of uh, trainings and uh, uh, for the ex and also offer them r courses for upgrading their qualification and I hope that our center will also offer more trainings because uh, on average when it comes to paramedic services they have to be upgraded and it's very good that Elena Panina is doing a lot for this and she provides lots of training and does a lot of awareness of work but there should be a federal decision made about establishing the specialty because right now you can become an extra lab worker only if you requalify Sergei Pavlovich we are thank you very much and um, as it is expected in Harvard within 30 seconds uh, they are to uh, lecturers to present themselves but we would like to ask you to talk in 30 seconds and talk about the future of radiology and medicine as a whole so can you describe it in 30 minutes in 30 seconds sorry no. fortunately <laughs> the answer is no but I, I think what Sergei mentioned, uh, a big part of our future is to work with highly trained medical technologists or what you call lab workers or uh, this is very important and I think that if radiology if diagnostic imaging is going to grow, there should be a good educational platform for a, a combined workforce where a doctor, a radiologist is working hand in hand with a medical imaging technologist to operate the equipment, to innovate and we find, I find that in our training system that many doctors are lacking in the technical skills. Most doctors nowadays don't have the technical skills anymore to really understand the equipment and what I always try to tell my registrars, my residents, my students is that if you want to lead, many doctors think that because they are doctors they should be able to lead. If you want to lead, you should understand the entire process. If you want to be the boss in a kitchen, you should understand how the oven works and how to cook an egg. And if you can't do that, you are never going to be a good leader. And I think that's the way to the future for radiology. That is an internal chronometer very well. Well, Sergey, the floor is yours. Well, I think uh, what we really lack at the moment, first of all, the uh, opportunity to upgrade your skills exponentially. And uh, we can say that an expert doctor has an impact when it comes to expert-based opinion because a doctor should be able to explain what kind of programs uh, and solutions he needs. Uh, secondly, and we do very little in this regard. Secondly, we need well-informed patients who understand why this or the other method is used, what screening is about, and what advantages it provides, and what are the risks of not going through the screening, and why the ultrasound is offered, and should the CT be done in this or the other way. And if the patients understand what is going on, then the communication is easier and then it's easier to prescribe these or other methods of diagnostics and uh, the patients also should be able to um, impact uh, organizing uh, medical services but this is a large challenge we will have to contract so we need to train our patients as well thank you very much uh, during the next session we are going to talk not only about the radiology but public health as well because we want this area to be transparent and clear but Dear friends, the essence of uh, medicine and science are the teams, teams that work for the benefit of the patient, and that is the most important thing. And I will not be tired to reiterate the great phrase that you can uh, uh, see in the first medical university that if you want to grow you should not forget your roots and the best phrase uh, uh, to, for this uh, talk is the large audience that we have. Thank you very much.